Michael Elise here. What is the historical parallel, the closest parallel to a politician who is this embroiled in legal problems in the run up to an election? What can you can you think of any? Is there any history <laughs> guidepost that can <laughs> nothing <sighs> I can give you the shortest answer on earth? Nothing at all. Uh, when have we seen, especially uh, not only former president, a presidential candidate, putative nominee, in court this way? And the other thing is that, you know, presidents in history, we elect them because they've been a success in their profession. I was uh, mentioning Washington Lincoln. General Grant won the war, uh, the Civil War, or uh, did a lot to help us win the Civil War. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower led forces on D Day. <clears throat> If Dwight Eisenhower had failed on D-Day and those forces had been turned back and they'd go back into the sea, do you think that he would have had a prayer of being elected in 1952? So Donald Trump this week is going to be shown as essentially a fraud. This was never a successful businessman, someone who does not obey the law, uh, someone who will not support the Constitution. As I was saying earlier, and more important than that, look at his record as president. Two things, and I'll just say these. Number one, our security and that of our children, we Americans, is protected by an elaborate system of alliances. Uh, Joe, you and Mika have talked about it a lot, beginning with NATO. Donald Trump has said, yes. elect me president again. I will vandalize NATO, and under certain circumstances, I'll tell Putin, do whatever the hell you want. Direct quote. And the other thing may be just as important. A president is supposed to protect our lives. Four years ago this month, the horrible COVID pandemic began. How well did Donald Trump do in telling Americans how to protect themselves, in mobilizing the forces of the federal government to be frank about the danger that was here, how people could find some way to make sure that we survive this thing? You know, I leave it to you. You know, I think all this year, day after day, we should say, what was Donald Trump doing uh, four years ago today to avert exactly. one, million, uh, 1 million deaths didn't happen? You know, <clears throat> Joe, listening to Michael Beschloss and everybody else here in the panel today talking about the myriad of issues and the weight of the problems, <clears throat> financial and political, that Donald Trump carries each and every day, I'm just thinking that we have been carrying this fugitive from justice in our history literally for over three decades before he even became a real public figure appearing on The Apprentice and running and winning the presidency of the United States. And I used to think I had some sort of an answer that he, you know, was a master of uh, focusing in on people's anger and resentment about uh, things around their lives, and that's one of the reasons he won. I no longer have an answer to it. I mean, he's been around and survived all of these incredible, weighty legal and political issues, and he's still here still here, still a free man. I have no explanation for this, Joe. What do you think? <laughs> well, you know, um, while you were talking, I just thought about something that Barack Obama said. Um, Elise, and I thought it was really insightful of him when he was running for president. He said something along the lines of, when people see me, they hold up a mirror and they see themselves, like the possibilities for themselves, the possibilities for being an American, the possibilities of, 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 of doing things that you couldn't do in, in many other countries. I wonder if this is the other side of that mirror and a mirror of resentment when, you know, the thing that has, the thing that has confounded us from, from the very beginning in 2015, I always talk about uh, Mark Halpern and John Heilman had a focus group, something you know a lot about. And there was a New Hampshire woman with tattoos uh, who, who was a, a blue-collar worker. And uh, Mark Halpern asked, uh, why do you support Donald Trump? And her answer was, because he's one of us. He's not. He's never been, <laughs> never will be. Uh, if he was uh, one of us, he would be in jail right now, like all the people from January the 6th, but he's been protected. So I wonder, again, is, is the vote for Donald Trump less about Donald Trump and more about the rejection of elites 
over the past 50, 60 years. Joe, you nailed it. That's all it is about at the end of the day. And it's what Donald Trump has done so masterfully, fully by he's made the grievances that he has, the grievances that people have against him. It's not about him, he tells his voters. It's about you. They are doing this to you. I am being persecuted. They're not doing this to me. They're doing this to you. And by pushing the victimhood narrative, he has managed to make this not just about himself and his problems of the day, but about a large swath of the country that is repulsed, frankly, by elites who are sitting in Washington and they feel like dictating their lives and looking down on them. So he's just, he's able to market that in a way unlike any other modern politician. Which is why, Mika, I know this sounds crazy, but yeah. everything about what's happened since 2015 politically has been crazy. Donald Trump declaring bankruptcy may be the best move for him, not just economically, but politically. For anybody, for anybody out there who thinks Donald Trump having to, to file for bankruptcy because of a massive uh, judgment against him, they think that will hurt him with his base. They haven't been paying attention over the past seven years because it would not it would hurt his pride. I don't think he'll do it because of his pride. But the base if Donald Trump had to commit uh, had, had to uh, file bankruptcy. I actually think it would help him politically. I, do, I think it would, too. And it would drag it out um, and he could use it. And um, the one of us term, it, it's so interesting because to answer Barnacle's question in a number of different ways, um, he inflated his assets in every way. Uh, he pretended to be the New Hampshire woman, one of us, I connect with you, mm -hmm. but he was also aspirational. Everybody, yeah. you know, dreamed to wear the red hat and be rich and famous and have gold-plated everything. He symbolized success in that way, and a lot of Americans who were really struggling day to day with their bills yeah. absolutely uh, felt aspirational in Donald Trump. So right, right. but you know the, th the the thing is though Jonathan Lemire being in politics I I have and doing the job I've done and interviewing people I've met a lot of rich people in my life I've met a lot of billionaires I've met a lot of self-made billionaires one of us I can understand it. Like I could, I could name you ten extraordinary stories. I know you could too of people who were born with nothing, who worked around the clocks. A lot of people who didn't didn't go to college. They just worked, 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 and and they were they are American success stories. What, what, what's so crazy on this one? This one of us thing. Donald Trump inherited the equivalent of four hundred million dollars, lost it all. I mean. He, he's, he's not one of them, never was one of them, which is why this whole one of us argument is confounding. You know, I think it was Tom Wicker that had a book uh, about Richard Nixon called One of Us. Nixon was. And Nixon was born, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a struggling family, just like Reagan. You could talk about Carter there. A lot of presidents, Gerald Ford, that grew up. Uh, Bill Clinton that grew up uh, and could say, hey, I'm one of you. I grew up like you. I understand what you're going through with your family. Joe Biden, my God, more than better than anybody else right now, understands what people go through when they struggle. Not Donald Trump. Mm -mm. That's where this whole one of us storyline just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense, but we've been living with it for nearly a decade now. This is a man who's got a skyscraper on Fifth Avenue with his name emblazoned in gold on the side, and he lives in a penthouse there. And yet, and yet, and I saw this when I was on the campaign trail in 2016, and you still hear it today, there are people out there who are very different from him, you know, from places, whether it's Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, Florida, wherever it might be, who say, this guy gets me. He understands. And some of that is because he gives voice to to grievance. He gives voice to that feeling of, I hear you, you've been left behind. It is a rebellion against the elites. And I think we, lose, we don't want to lose sight of how 
powerful that was in 2016, coming not long after the financial meltdown, coming not that long after the Middle Eastern wars, coming not long after, frankly, the election of a black man as president, which cannot be overstated there. So many white mm -hmm. working class Americans felt like, hey, this country's changing. It's breaking away from me. This guy will bring it back. And then you add that to this culture of just celebrity uh, and victimhood that has created since. And it's still a potent political mix.